All right, well, uh, today we continue in our study in Genesis. And today's lesson is in chapter 32. And we're looking at Jacob's return to Canaan. And as he turns toward his homeland, he anticipates an encounter with Esau, his brother. But I want, I want to start back in chapter 31. So last week, Todd spoke about Jacob's second, third, and fourth wives too many. Um, talked about their competition in childbirth. And talked about God prospering Jacob's flocks, or I should say Laban's flocks for Jacob. And in the first two verses of chapter 31, the word reveals that Laban's sons were not pleased with what they saw taking place. And it also highlights that Jacob was aware of the change in attitude, of Laban's attitude toward him, and even toward his family. And so I want to pick up at verse 3. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So, with that request, that direction from the Lord, in verses 4 through 13, Jacob calls for Rachel and Leah, and he explains why they should leave. And he points out what he's been tasked with, what he's encountered, and the way they've been treated. And then in verses 10 through 12, Jacob reveals that God spoke to him in a dream about the livestock, foretelling what was to take place. And then in verse 13, the Lord says, I, this is the verse, uh, chapter 31, 13, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. And so, we see in verses 14 through 16 that both of his wives agree that they should leave. And then in verses 17 through 21, Jacob leaves secretly with all that he has. So he takes everything, wives, maidservants, livestock, his children, and they leave. And in verses 22 through 35, we see that Laban discovers that Jacob's picked up and left. He's not at all happy about that. He overtakes Jacob and his family 
And he confronts them about leaving, but he also confronts them about taking the household gods that Laban had. And with those accusations then in verses 36 through 41, Jacob in turn addresses Laban and says, you falsely accused me. We don't have them. And in that, as that transpires, we learn that his wife Rachel is a liar and a deceiver. And then we get to verse 42, and Jacob says that God has provided, even in all of the trials that he's had in all these years that he was serving Laban. So with that acknowledgement and Jacob's challenges to Laban, and Laban having been warned by God not to do any harm, in verses 43 through 55, we see the covenant that's established between Laban and Jacob, and then Laban departs. And that brings us to chapter 32. Chapter 32, verse 1. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. That means two camps or double camp. So Jacob acknowledges that God is encamped there because the angels appear to him. So he acknowledges that this is God's camp, not unlike his recognition in Bethel before he ever went to see Laban's family. And then also Jacob's claiming it's also his camp. It's a place of double camps. And so what we see on the map there, somewhere off in the land of Laban, Jacob comes and he comes along the river, it's actually a stream, Jabbok, to a place that he calls Mahanaim. And at this place, the angels of God meet him. Picking up in verse 3, Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my master Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, men servants and maid servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. So this alarms Jacob pretty severely because anytime somebody is traveling with 400 men, they're men of war. <clears throat> they're not your tailor and your cook. So Jacob, we see in verses 7 and 8, Jacob is in great fear and distress. He divided the people who were with him into two groups 
or two camps. And the flocks and herds and camels as well. They were also divided. And Jacob's thought, verse 8, if Esau comes and attacks one group or camp, the camp that is left may escape. So Jacob is formulating a plan, anticipating a confrontation or worse with Esau, likely still in the back of his mind, the threats that he heard before he ever left to go to Laban, that Esau was planning to kill him as soon as their father passed away. Verse 9, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea which cannot be counted. So as Jacob prays, we see a level of humility acknowledging his position before a holy God. Jacob notes that God is the one that is responsible for the blessings in Jacob's life. In verse 11, he's praying to be delivered from the hand of Esau. And then in verse 12, But you have said, I will surely make you prosper. It will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So is this a reliance on what God had already said? Or is Jacob reminding God of what God said? Or maybe a little bit of both. And this is the first recorded prayer of Jacob since he left Bethel on his way to Padan Aram. Twenty years have passed. That doesn't mean he hadn't prayed, but this is the first recorded prayer since his encounter with the angels and with the Lord at Bethel. And so, beginning in verse 13, he spent the night there and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 female camels with their young, 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you and ask, to whom do you belong and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob they are a gift 
sent to my Lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, the third, and all the others who followed the herds, you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him, and be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For Jacob thought, I will pacify him, that is Esau, with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later, when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. So in these verses we see Jacob's plan part two. First he divides everything he has into two camps, thinking that if Esau attacks one, the other might escape. Then he prays to the Lord, and then he goes back to making his own plan. So we see in this plan of his, part two, he gathers a present for Esau. 550 animals, not counting the young of the camels, which would be in addition to that. And he separates them into five droves, or the five herds, okay? So there's five droves, five messengers, and five repeated statements by each messenger, one after the other, to Esau. Hoping to pacify Esau. Now, is that in reliance of the prayer that we saw? So is he making plans as he interprets God's response, if there was any? Or is he planning on his own? We really don't know. So we're told in 21, the present goes forth, and Jacob spends the night in the camp. Picking up in verse 22, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. His hip was dislocated. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the Israelites Do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. (laughs) 
So Jacob, after he sent his gifts ahead of him, spent the night in the camp. But during the night, he gets up and for whatever reason decides to send his wives and the children and all of what's left in that camp across the river. So is he sleepless? Is he restless? Is he fearing the rate of Esau's approach? Is he still rolling this plan through his head? Making sure he's not left a stone unturned? And so, in the night, he took them and sent them. His family crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And then Jacob is left alone. So picture very much like his trek toward the homeland of Laban in Bethel when he lays his head on a rock and he's alone and he has an encounter with the Lord. So as he's alone, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So as Jacob wrestles with his fear of Esau, as Jacob wrestles with the soundness of his plan, his plan segregating everything he has into two camps, his plan of sending these 550 animals ahead of him to Esau, as he re wrestles with these things, wrestles with his uneasiness, God comes to Jacob to redirect Jacob's focus. A man, God himself, as we see Jacob acknowledge in verse 30, a man comes and wrestles with Jacob, or Jacob wrestles with the man, And they wrestle until daybreak. So we see Jacob acknowledge that it was God himself. And then in Hosea chapter 12, Hosea is laying out the curses and talking about the sin of the tribes of Israel. And in chapter 12 of Hosea, picking up in verse 2, the Lord has a charge to bring against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways and repay him according to his deeds. In the womb, he grasped his brother's heel as a man, he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. So, in Hosea, it acknowledges that this is the angel of the Lord that has come to wrestle with Jacob.
in verse 25. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, that's the NIV. The NASB says, when the man saw that he had not prevailed against him. He touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched or dislocated as he wrestled. So God comes to Jacob, even though it's the angel of the Lord, in the form of a man, and he comes in a form that actually allows Jacob to physically wrestle. And he allows Jacob to wrestle with him without being defeated, without either one prevailing. So at Jacob's age, he has remarkable strength. But certainly, the angel of the Lord in this form allowed Jacob to not prevail and stayed his own hand as to not prevail in this wrestling match. And yet, with a single touch, he disables Jacob. And yet Jacob won't let go. And so the angel of the Lord in verse 26 says, let me go. So I find that an interesting question. Or statement. Does Jacob realize that God has brought him from periodic encounters and an occasional clinging to God to a point now where there's a demonstrative, forceful grasp? Does that register with Jacob that all this time since Bethel it's been an occasional acknowledgement, maybe an occasional clinging to if he needed, but does he realize as this demand is made, let me go, and he refuses to let go, does he realize why he's refusing to let go. Jacob says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. We've seen this before. Jacob wants a blessing. He was conniving and got the blessing from his father Isaac. He had a little bit of help. He wanted blessings from Laban. He wants blessings from Esau. So does he realize he's asking for a blessing from God himself? Does he realize why he's hanging on so tightly? Does he understand the nature of the source of this blessing that he's requesting? Does he have any idea what kind of blessing he's asking for? Is he thinking, it's the blessing that I got from my father Isaac? Do I want that same blessing? Do I recall what that blessing was? Do I recall that that blessing was also the one that Isaac's father received? So don't let me go. Hold on. Bless me. And then I'll let you go. 
So, is this a bargaining with God? Does he realize who he has a hold of and what he's asking? Or what's being asked of him? What if, when the angel of the Lord said, let me go, Jacob, let's go. But he didn't. And so the angel of the Lord in verse 27 asked Jacob, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And we can read past that really quickly if we're not careful. But this is a pivotal turning point. This is a pivotal turning point in Jacob's life. If he stops to think about what does his name even mean? Jacob means deceiver, the heel catcher, grabbing the heel of his brother before they're even out of the womb. And so, this deceiver, this heel catcher, is about to get a new name. He doesn't know this yet. And he hasn't yet really acknowledged that this is the angel of the Lord. But in that day and culture, what a name meant was who you were. And so... Surely, with Jacob asking for a blessing, when he told the angel, the man, what his name was, surely Jacob went through those meanings of what Jacob stood for, what Jacob meant. And so in verse 28, the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Israel means God's fighter or he struggles with God so we don't know how long this discussion took we don't know if there were pauses in the conversation but I would like to think that Jacob already knew what Israel meant. And is it dawning on him that he's been struggling with God through the night? Quite frankly, struggling with God most of his life. And does it dawn on him what this new name means? And he does, does he recall the story when Abram was confronted by the angel of the Lord and his name was changed to Abraham. Does he recall the stories of Sarai and her name being changed to Sarah? I don't know if any of that crossed his mind at that point. But for what's recorded in scripture, It's a pretty rare occurrence. A new name, a new meaning, a new destiny in life by the hand of God. And then, this importance on names, in verse 29, Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he, the angel of the Lord, replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed them there. But my guess is there's a pause there too. Verse 
Jacob has a sincere desire to know the name. Not unlike Moses wanting to know the name of God. But any time you have an encounter, especially in that culture, you want to know the name. What's, what does the name represent? What does it stand for? Do their actions go along with what their name means? And so Jacob asked. But the angel replies, Why do you ask my name? So a couple of thoughts occurred to me then. How does Jacob process that question? The angel of the Lord wants to know, why is it, Jacob, that you want to know my name? First thing that comes to me is, are you sincere? Do you really want to know my name? Are you sincere? Do you really want to know my name? Don't you already know my name? And then, do you really want to know? Have you thought that through? And about what happens when you find out my name? And then, what will you do when you know my name? So I picture a pause there as those thoughts run through Jacob's head. Again, we're not told that happened in Scripture, but I'd like to think he gave it some thought about what he's asking and then what it would mean if he found out. And then the angel of the Lord blessed him there in that place. And then we see in verse 30 that Jacob called the place Peniel, which means face of God, saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. So here, we get the answer to the question. Jacob realizes that he was wrestling with God, the angel of the Lord. Jacob, here in verse 30, acknowledges that fact. And very much like his encounter at Bethel, I'm changing the name of this place to memorialize what's just occurred. So, this angel of the Lord that appeared, God himself in what can best be described as a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ as the angel of the Lord takes place with Jacob very much like it did with Abraham. Even Hagar had an encounter with the angel of the Lord. A discussion, quote unquote, face to face. And so in 30, verse 30, Jacob realizes what's taken place. He acknowledges what's taken place. He commemorates it by changing the name of the place. Face of God. Then the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. So, 
he leaves this place with this acknowledgement. Trying to process that he now has a new name. Trying to sort out what this means going forward. It's clear he struggled with men in the past and in doing so had struggles with God himself in the past. And so we look back through Jacob's life and it had very much been wrought with struggles. He had struggles with Esau from before they were born all the way up to this point. He contended with his father Isaac over the birthright and over the blessing. He contended with Laban for 20 years for two wives and a herd of critters. He contended with his wives. Two, three, and four too many. And now, he's had an encounter directly with God in the form of a man, the angel of the Lord. And so as he makes this walk, limping, leaving this place that he just renamed the face of God, What's going through his mind? Has he automatically switched to this encounter with Esau that's about to happen? Or is he still enthralled with this hand-to-hand -hand struggle with the angel of the Lord and the blessing that came from it? So God has brought Jacob to the point now where Jacob will be God's servant. Jacob is going to be God's servant in the line of Abraham, the line of Isaac, and now Jacob. His name's been changed to Israel. And God is using Jacob as he prepares to raise up the nation of Israel. And so we can look fast forward through the Testament of Scripture to see that Israel very much continues then and now to struggle with men and with God. And yet God continues to use Israel. And so here as Jacob leaves, as Jacob goes to catch up with his wives and children, he's left with, or maybe more appropriately stated, he is given a permanent reminder of his need to depend on God in all things. Um, I'm certain Todd will touch on it when we get there. But as Jacob has to lean more forcefully on his staff... He's reminded that he has to always lean on the God of creation. So we can look at 
something like that in our lives and say it's a detriment, it's a nuisance, it's an inconvenience or worse. But the reality is, God's given him a quote-unquote gift, maybe not unlike the thorn in Paul's side, as a constant reminder of to whom does he belong and upon whom must he rely in every circumstance. Now, does he do that? through the balance of his life, not necessarily. But it had to be an ongoing, constant reminder of what occurred in that place that he called face of God, what that meant as he tries to ford the jabbock, limping on a staff, and then as he crosses that stream and looks up and sees Esau approaching, is he still clinging to the angel of the Lord, refusing to let go? Is he still clinging to the blessing that he just received? Is he leaning on God as Esau approaches? And we're actually going to skip that piece as we get into next week. But does he recognize God's handiwork as he greets Esau and Esau greets him? And rather than a war, they fall upon each other's shoulders with a kiss of love, reunited in a way that certainly Jacob hadn't dreamed of. And it turns out they had both been blessed. And so as they then go their separate ways, Jacob's left with this constant reminder of God's blessing, God's provision, and his need to always rely upon the Lord. So I'll close with that and open up to any questions, comments that anybody has. Yeah, so, so the gift that, that Jacob sends ahead, you can look at that, is that a bribe? Is it a demonstration that I'm well provided for, so don't think I'm coming and you're going to, I'm going to rely upon you, okay? Um, it's an out-and-out gift, but certainly we're told in Scripture that he made that plan to appease Esau, okay? Now, if Esau was still uh, determined to kill him, I don't think that would have mattered. But obviously we see that, that, that Esau's attitude had changed. Yeah. He didn't know that yeah, he didn't know that until their encounter, but yeah. Yeah, so I didn't dig to see if there's anybody else in that time span, but I believe that's correct, that it was Abraham and then Sarah and now Jacob's name. Yeah, yeah. Somebody a little later on, he's out here, so now we'll change the names too, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, Larry, would you close us?
might live and grow in what you have to be in Christ. So we thank you for our teachers in this place. Come learn more. We might be all you have to do. Give you honor and glory for all. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you.